Belfast and trying to develop new strategies um, to repair blood vessels, uh, in particular interest in diabetes. So I'm going to talk to you in the next 20 minutes or so about um, how we approach um, this issue of vascular repair uh, for diabetes and, and with the cells we use and we work in the lab are the ones you see in this screen that we call endothelial colony forming cells. So in this talk, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to endogenitors and what are what we use the ECFCs, um, which are the cells that you see there on the left, and then why uh, we want to um, use them, apply them for um, diabetes. Um, so the, the field of endothelial progenitors really started on the early 2000s with, with three milestone papers, as you see there. And after those three papers, you've seen a, 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 an immense increase in publications in relation to vascular repair and endothelial progenitors. Um, now reaching even a thousand, and this is just from last week, um, a thousand papers every year. Now that's, that's declining, so there's a bit of, of less of interest in these cells, and, and you'll probably understand why in the next slides. So what are endothelial progenitors? These are cells that have the capacity to differentiate into endothelial cells. These are the cells that line our blood vessels. Um, and um, as the previous speaker was um, talking about, so we don't really, I mean, there's debate about the niche, what's the home of these cells. Classically, they've been thought to be located in the bone marrow. Um, however, more recently, um, there's many reports that there are specific niches in every organ, and, and we and others believe that actually blood vessels are an, an actual niche. So the adventitia of the cells may be the actual niche for these endothelial uh, progenitors, vascular progenitors. Nevertheless, uh, even though we don't really know accurately where they are uh, located, their niche, they definitely circulate in blood. So we can isolate them from peripheral blood. Um, so these are the, the papers that give rise to the, um, to the field. So in, 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 in these papers, as you can see here in the mouse high limb ischemia model, um, you can see the Doppler, um, the limb is blue, so there's no perfusion. And when you inject um, mature endothelial cells, you see nothing happening, but when you inject endothelial progenitors, you see within four weeks, uh, reperfusion, a uh, repair of those blood vessels. Uh, um, and after two, two years after that publication, um, there was a, a clinical trial, um, first in man in Japan, where they actually, uh, in a handful of patients, they showed that they could rescue limbs from amputation um, simply by injecting these uh, cells. Um, since then, there's been a lot of um, hope that these cells will become the next therapy for, for um, regeneration of blood vessels in the heart, in the, in the limbs, and, and in the retina. Now, while in the heart and in the limbs, there's been many, 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 more than 20 clinical trials uh, in each. For the retina, there's, there has been none uh, um, up to now. So these are some meta-analysis um, of those clinical trials using cell therapies for um, the ischemic limbs, amputation, or for the ischemic hearts, myocardial infarction. And as you can see there in the meta-analysis, basically the, the take home message is the therapy works, but there's a great variability. Uh, and if you take all the data into account, there's really a minimal benefit. Um, in the case of the limbs, for example, if you see that um, on, the, on the left, Basically, the, the, the reduced for risk of amputation is 37%. So roughly, you have to inject four patients, and maybe, hopefully, one will rescue uh, the, the, the patient from limb amputation. So it's, it works, but it's really not that effective. Um, and since then, there's been many um, calls, uh, both positive and negative. So the FDA highlighted that uh, continuing these trials was, was, was worrisome. Uh, there were scientists are saying that we need to reevaluate the ethics. Uh, how can we keep doing these trials when, when we know they are ineffective? Now, other people were more positive and they were saying we, should, we need to keep trying because the cells, it just needs optimization. So there's a, a bit of debate in the field what we should do uh, and why these trials that work in, in mouse uh, and in animals didn't translate into humans. Now, there's many reasons, and we can discuss for hours and hours, and I've discussed this with many colleagues, but uh, the, here are some, of, some, some, some points why I think and we think this hasn't really translated. Um, some of the things like uh, the previous talk, so the, the number six, so basically you are putting the cells in ischemic tissue, hypoxic, fibrotic tissue, so really maybe the, the location is not good. Uh, I mean, if you go the other one, number three there, so the, the target population, for ethical reasons, most trials use the most severe disease to prove safety, but at the same time, 
maybe that's not the best population if, if the tissue is too damaged, there's no really potential for, for repair. Now, I mean, there's many others, but the one I'm gonna focus is number one, which the one we've, we've been putting some effort in. So it's the accurate definition of the cells. So when you inject cells, you need to check that the cells you are injecting are, um, are pure and you may need to, to define their mechanism of action and define their, their phenotype. Um, so um, there is many ways we can isolate endothelial progenitors uh, from peripheral blood or umbilical cord blood. Um, basically, you just uh, try to purify the cells with, by a density gradient method. Um, and um, the first um, generation of clinical trials using these progenitors were basically just doing that with bone marrow um, and injecting the bone marrow and, and with the hope that that will um, repair. And sometimes it worked, but uh, as you can imagine, the bone marrow contains stem cells, but it can also contain uh, mostly hematopoietic cells. So maybe the, the, the amount percentage of progenitors, vascular progenitors, hematopoietic progenitors within the bone marrow that is injected into patients is 10%, 5% or less. Um, so really we are in, we, trials were injecting hematopoietic cells. Um, so based on that, then the second generation was trying to do sorting and, and, and there's many teams and including us, we are doing sorting for specific markers to increase uh, uh, the, heterogen the homogeneity in, in the cells that we inject. Now, another approach, which, which I show you here is, is cell culture. So using very specific protocols, uh, substrates, growth factors, you can actually uh, isolate uh, quite uh, well-defined cell types. And as you can see in the images, um, you can isolate just by changing the substrate and growth factors. These very two distinct um, cell types, which are both known in the literature as endothelial progenitors. So when we did transcriptomics, proteomics, and different analysis, we basically prove, and this is published, that um, this cell that we call endothelial colony forming cell is the true bona fide endothelial progenitors. Um, all the others um, are not as pure and they are, some of them are not endothelial. Um, so going back a decade or so ago, um, we and, and Indiana were among the first ones isolating these cells. Uh, and there were then many other labs across the globe that um, basically replicated and, and optimized these protocols of endothelial colony forming cell um, isolation, expansion, and use in, in, in preclinical models. So then what we decided to do is we got together as a consortium to try to, um, to, to um, advise the field um, in relation to the cells that we are using. And, and we basically wrote this consensus statement review uh, among all these labs um, across the five continents. And we're basically saying, well, people injecting these cells, one approach is flow cytometry and you, the most um, used phenotype would be CD34 positive, BGFR2 positive. And that is considered a putative potential endothelial progenitor. Um, the other one that people are using more and more is cell culture. And it, when you do cell culture, depending on, on your conditions, you will isolate a hematopoietic or a non-hematopoietic cell. And that's very easy to see because obviously you can check for CD45, CD14 uh, hematopoietic markers. And, and you, you have on one side negative and on the other side positive. Um, and the, the ones just by morphology, then you can go on and check and, and you can define your population as being endothelial, um, CD31 positive and other endothelial markers or being hematopoietic. And that one is mostly myeloid uh, monocytic cell type. So uh, we, we decided to, to focus more our attention on the endothelial ones, the endothelial colony forming cells. Um, and so we were trying to see how can we uh, optimize um, their um, uh, protocols, methodologies, um, and in particular for, for diabetic, diabetic vasculopathy. And why diabetes? Diabetes, I mean, we all know it is high, high sugar, high glucose, insulin, um, but um, really the, the target um, organ that it's damaged by the oxidative, oxidative stress and inflammation induced by diabetes is the vasculature. So all the complications of diabetes, most of them uh, retinopathy, eye disease, nephropathy, kidney disease, cardiomyopathy, atherosclerosis, all of them are related to damage of blood vessels. Um, and 
people are interested in stopping the damage, but actually our, our line of thought is stopping the damage is, is good, but what about promoting repair? So not only stopping the damage, but actually promoting repair on those diabetic tissues. So if we know that the endothelial cells are dying in, in diabetic tissues, can we regenerate them um, using endothelial progenitors? Now, there's been many efforts to mobilize endothelial progenitors in these patients, and unfortunately, it's now quite well accepted that endothelial progenitors are dysfunctional, in diabetic patients to a certain degree, number and, and functionality is uh, impaired. Therefore, um, the alternative approach is basically inject cells. So can we inject progenitors that are healthy so that they can do the job and repair the vasculature? So um, what I'm showing you here is, is all mouse models. Uh, and in these mouse models of the retina, this is I'm concentrated on, on, on the diabetic retina in, in rodents. Um, we, we know that in diabetic models, there's less vascular density, there's less blood vessels in the retina, there's increased number of acellular capillaries, as you, as you can see in the histology for the trips in digest on the bottom right. There is appearance of these um, microaneurysms and of these areas of very light pink, which we identify as occluded capillaries. So there's really ischemia in those diabetic retinas. And obviously, if you see you have less blood vessels, you have ischemia, vascular occlusion, what you get is hypoxia. So when we do um, staining for the hypoxia prof in green, as you can see in the slide, the diabetic animals have more hypoxia uh, in the retinas um, than the uh, wild type non-diabetic um, animals. So the idea is, can we induce vascular repair in, in diabetes? And again, to show that really one of the early first hallmarks of diabetic retinopathy is damage of blood vessels. So in, in, in blood vessels in diabetes, what you get is loss of endothelial cells, loss of pericytes that leads to vascular leakage, inflammation, and, and that triggers everything. So microglia activation, loss of photoreceptors, edema, um, but all starts with, with loss of endothelial cells. So really we want to target the, the primary cause of the disease in, in diabetic retinopathy. So first, we were focusing on the cells, so the endothelial colony forming cells. They, they form a nice cobblestone monolayer, as you can see in the image. We can characterize them using microscopes, so they have all the endothelial markers you would expect. One thing which is important and we're very strict is the purity, and as you can see in the flow cytometry, C31, CD105, as examples uh, of endothelial markers, we have more they are almost 100%. So they, all the cells in that culture express endothelial markers. Um, now, it's not only the positive markers, but we also check for negative markers. So we, the purity, and we check for, in this case, um, CD45, so leukocyte common antigen, and CD14 um, for uh, mon monocyte, monocytic markers, myeloid markers. And again, as you can see, that is less than 1%. So we confirm that the cells are highly, extremely pure. And, and this is no um, surprise to us uh, because we can actually single cell clone the cells if we want. The cells have such proliferative capacity. They are progenitors that we can actually single cell clone the cells. Um, despite the identity and purity, the other thing which is very important is the potency. So what we do to check functionality and potency is uh, what, what do endothelial cells do? They form blood vessels, vascular networks. So we have a 3D model uh, in Matrigel where we put the cells and you can see they are round single cells and within two, three days, they form a nice connected vascular network with lumens. Um, that is, is our, our uh, potency test. So we show that the cell is what we want. So we identify identity, it's pure and it does the job, it has potency. Um, and then what we did is we use a mouse model. And as you can see here in this video, um, and this is published as well. So what you can see here is we have injected these endothelial colony forming cells into a mouse model of ischemic retinopathy. So that's the green is the mouse um, retinal vasculature and the cells were injected were labeled in red. And as you can see in the video, they are actually contributed to vascular repair across um, in some of those in the retinal vascular bed, specifically in the, in the superficial plexus. So they, they do have efficacy in the mouse, they uh, repair the ischemic vasculature. Um, we also did angiographs. This is what you would do in, in, in patients. So uh, when we do the angiographs to evaluate the, the vasculature in these retinas, um, we can actually see in the shaman vehicle, there's lots of, of black, lots of uh, vascular areas. But when we inject the cells, you start seeing less black and more of this uh, vascular network. So injecting the cells is 
making new blood vessels in these ischemic retinas. To be able to quantify this objectively with this histology, so what you see down there is retinal flat mounts. So basically the back of the eye is flat mounted and stained for blood vessels in green. Um, and what you see in the central part is ischemic area. And what you can, um, you can uh, notice there is that when you inject the cells, um, you can actually see a significant decrease in this avascular area. The black area decreases when you inject the progenitor cells. And that we have quantified and demonstrated that that is significant. So the cells do help decrease a vascular area. So promote vascular repair in this mouse model. Um, the other question that we had was, um, well, these cells are injected intravitreally, but what about injecting them uh, into the circulation so that they are on the other side of, of, of the damage? Um, in order to do that, um, I had a very talented postdoc that optimized a technique to inject the cells into the carotid artery in the mouse. Uh, and as a proof of concept, um, she injected these um, flore fluorophor bits, fluorescent bits. Um, and you can see that if you inject it in the carotid artery, um, they will reach only the ipsilateral retina. So you react in the right, you only find the beads in the right retina and not in the left. So you can actually, by injecting into the artery, carotid artery, you can actually decide one retina and not the other. And when we did this the experiment with ECFCs, with the cells, you can actually see um, that um, only the ipsilateral retina, you see a decrease um, in the in the um, avascular areas, while in the contralateral area, there was no difference. Um, so we demonstrated that we can actually also inject the cell systemically through the carotid artery and still the cells have uh, efficacy. And we also compare the intracarotid delivery versus the intravitreal delivery. And in both cases, they were comparable. So if you inject them into the vitreous or into the carotids, the effect was similar. So finally, the other thing we will look at is toxicity because when you are developing cell therapies, you don't want to be inducing damage in the tissues. Um, uh, and always when you inject progenitors, there people ask you about tumorigenicity, immunogenicity, inflammation. So what we did here, we had an, an adult, adult healthy mouse and we injected the cells intravitreally. And what you see in the histology there uh, is the vitreous um, and, in, and you can probably see the retina there in the back of the eye and the vitreal cavity in between. And the cells, as you can see in the arrows, um, they are actually in the, in, in, the, in the vitreal cavity when they are injected and they are there two hours, 12 hours. And at one day they start going to apoptosis and within a week they are cleared out. So if they are not needed, if there is an, a healthy mouse adult eye, the cells basically don't do, don't seem to do any harm. They don't induce um, inflammation. Um, as you can see down there, the, the re those retinas look intact. Um, and there's no much, uh, there's no immune response. There's no inflammation. There's no retinal detachment or fibrosis. We also use um, to order to quantify it, um, more accurately the, the, um, the cells injected, we use the ALU element PCR, so which is just uh, for, for identifying human DNA because this is human cells injected into the mouse. And as you can see in the, in the table, basically within one day, we, can, we lose completely human DNA. So when we do this at three days and seven days in the mouse retinas injected with human cells, um, basically we can't identify the progenitor. So if, if the retina is healthy, the cells really are not incorporating. So just to summarize, um, what I've shown you is um, we, we believe that these cells have promising, um, can be used, have promised to be used uh, for ischemic retinas, in particular the diabetic retina. Uh, we, but in order to do that, you need to define the cell. And we define our ECFCs, which have a very stringent immunophenotype. Uh, in terms of purity. And it's not only ident identity and purity, but also the function that we need to check. Um, we do get sometimes a, a cell that is, it has good identity and purity, but it doesn't perform. So obviously, uh, if you have a cell that has the phenotype, but it doesn't perform in the potency assays, we wouldn't want to use that cell. Um, we have also optimized in delivery routes and cell doses, um, and we are starting to look at, at toxicity, which it seems the cells don't have uh, don't show much toxicity in in this in, in the retina, at least in the retina. And with that, uh, what's what's next for us? Basically, we, we want we are looking into how to enhance the therapeutic potential of these cells. How how can we make them resistant to hypoxia? We are also looking at at expanding in more models of diabetes and um, vasculopathy models. 
uh, we all we definitely need clinical grade cells because all the data I've shown you is with research grade cells. Um, and hopefully in the next three, five years, we should be able to move to a phase one, phase two clinical trial. Uh, 